Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. I am back with another true crime video and today we are going to be doing the story of Kirsten Klex and Bafana Mawungela. Now if you're new to this channel, I try and do those videos often so please do check out the playlist. I've done a couple already and I will be doing more in the near future. So about today's video, I just have one disclaimer. This case is relatively new. It only happened on the 29th of October 2023 and therefore for legal reasons I have to state that these are just allegations because they are yet to be proven in a court of law. With that said and without wasting any more time, let's dive into today's video. Today's case takes us to Middleburg in Bumalanga and subsequently we will end up in Santon in Johannesburg, South Africa. Bafana Mawungela was born in the year 2002 in a large farming and industrial town called Middleburg in Bumalanga province. He is one of five children and although his parents got divorced when he was pretty young, he grew up in a relatively normal environment and a happy home navigating between the two parents who worked very hard to provide for him everything that he needed. You can see this from his old social media accounts where he posted often between the year 2014 and 2016. He was always posting trendy items that his parents provided for him. He also shared pictures going out and about with his family so he was definitely living a normal and comfortable life. He attended Stillcrest High School in Middleburg from grade 8 all the way to matric. This is when his friends during this period described him as someone who was a daydreamer, saying he would stare into space for long periods of time. They also said that he played rugby during this time and enjoyed watching anime. He was also said to be a pretty funny guy, but one of his friends mentioned that a lot of people didn't really get his humor. Now, an example of this humor that I came across and that many people would later say they failed to get as well was one of his posts that he put on Instagram. This was back in 2016. He was around 14 years old. So he put up a meme on Instagram, as many people used to do during this time period. And that meme basically read, how do you get a girl to come home with you? And then it gives three options. Option one, good looks and then it has a picture of David Beckham. Option two is wealth and then option three is chloroform. Now for those of you who don't know what chloroform is, it's basically a toxic substance that renders a person unconscious within five minutes of inhalation. Basically you get unconscious for a period of 20 minutes up to two hours or even longer depending on the concentration of the chloroform. The 14-year-old Bafana Mawungela found this funny, or at least very intriguing to say the least. Nonetheless, he completed his matric in 2021 and, and decided that he wanted to complete his higher education in Johannesburg at a private college in Santon. In January of 2022, he traveled with his father all the way from Middleburg to Johannesburg, Santon, where he would then register at Varsity College. Now, Varsity College is the most accredited private higher education provider in South Africa. Because it's a private college, it also has much smaller classes in comparison to its public counterparts, and therefore it is way more expensive than a normal university. Nonetheless, this was Bafana's first choice, and this is where he wanted to study, and Dad made sure to provide. Now, because Varsity College is a private college, it doesn't offer residence to students. So students normally have to find their own off-campus accommodation, whether it's in apartments or it's in communal sharing spaces, uh, which are not too far from Varsity. Now, Bafana decided that he wanted to stay in an apartment that was not too far from campus, and this is where he would stay. His first year in Johannesburg was definitely not without incident. So Bafana was always out and about drinking with friends, and he had a few run-ins with the authorities. Now one could argue that that is what first year students do. They drink and they go out. Now surely not to the extent we are about to unpack now. So you will remember I said that Bafana opted to stay in an apartment for his first year. Now this particular apartment wasn't really a student friendly apartment but rather it catered for families and individuals who are possibly already working. So Bafana was one of the very few if not only students who was staying in this particular apartment completely makes sense. Uh, the lease was, after all, under his father. It's not really clear whether they knew that he was staying there by himself or the lease was under someone else's name, but nonetheless, he stayed. Now, a few months into his stay, Bafana started being a bit too comfortable and he started getting himself in a lot of trouble around the complex. He would follow women around the complex. Now, there's two different incidents that are on record that happened in this particular complex. 
uh, where Bafana would follow women around to their apartments. Now, I feel like I will not do the story justice if I tell it myself. So I'm about to insert a clip of the woman sharing the story of Bafana. This happened way before the Kirsten story. It's, well, she's only telling the story, obviously, in retrospect, because now she saw Bafana trending on TikTok. And this is when she started sharing her own story about Bafana that had happened a year prior. But I will put her handle in the description below law so that you guys can check her out she is on tiktok and also shout out to danny's channel i think they're new on youtube i'm going to make sure that i leave the channel on the screen and also in the description box so that you guys are able to go check them out if you were on the fence regarding this whole case i think this video is going to tip you over to one side the first time i heard about it was when i was walking out the gate and the security guard who was there the time of the incident. So he's calling me and telling me that, um, do you remember that boy we're going to to court with? Because he was also part of the court. Yes. I'm like, oh, okay, yes, that boy, yes, that boy. Um, did you hear that the boy killed someone in the park just up the road? I'm like, how? But I was just driving out the gate, so I didn't have time to stand there and be listening to everything because there was things I had to go do. Yes. He said I must go to Instagram and type Bafana. And then I'm going to see this boy. I go to Instagram and then I'm seeing headlines. And then I start becoming interested until this news, this news feed starts flooding my, um, my timeline. You yes. see, on TikTok typing up and they keep showing. Yeah. Mm. And then I see it. I start becoming interested. And then as I watch more and more of them, more pages and more pages with that story are showing up. And then I become shocked mm. and thinking that okay, I don't understand what happened here. I see a picture of him wearing this blue t-shirt that the lady was wearing moments uh, before yes. he was captured on that camera. I start thinking to myself, because this guy once followed me from the swimming pool, you see, did he mean to do the same thing to me? It, it scared me a lot. And knowing that he knows where we live and he knows my unit number, he used to be, he used to be in the same complex as us. I, I was scared. I, I'm not going to lie. I was scared. It started giving me anxiety after yes. I could see the facts on TikTok and everyone talking about it on social media. Yes. I started seeing the facts. I'm like, this is what he meant to do. That 4th of September 2022, when he followed me at home with Brian every, every Sunday, we yes. have a Brian, me, James, and my daughter, that family Brian, that intimate thing. We are house people, by the way. We like being indoors we don't go out except we're going to do grocery shopping you see or to do important stuff okay what happened that day was i woke up as usual james had taken out the meat from the freezer to bry because he's always doing the brying and i'm doing the cooking in the inside yes and then it's it was very warm that day very very warm okay what happens is i get to the swimming pool with my daughter yes there is two girls who look like teenagers, I would say around 18, 19. Mm -hmm. and then I see this boy. He looks very young as well, younger than me. Okay, I greet a normal hello as you would when you find people sitting. In I carried an ice bucket that had my beer and my daughter's water with ice in it. Mm -hmm. And when we got there, I put it on top of the tables on the porch. There's a porch next to the clubhouse. Yes, yes. yes. And then on the table, they got a bottle of vodka. Their own ice bucket, but this bottle of vodka didn't have any, mix, any mixer or anything. It was just in an ice bucket, and you could see that they had been here because there were, bottle, there were bottles of juices, empty juices. Then speaks to the girls, there's a little argument in their corner. Far from us, we really cannot hear what they're arguing about. Hmm. These two girls decide to then take their stuff they came with, which was towels and um, flip-flops, mm -hmm. to just get out of the swimming pool. One of them is wearing his boxers. You see these check boxers that the guys like wearing that you can clearly see that this is for a guy. You slept at the guy's house and you woke up to wear his boxers. Yes, she was wearing that. Yes. They said they are going to his house to change. They are leaving. He did not follow them. He remained mm -hmm. with us there. He then got up, went to my table. He took my beer without asking me and then opened it. And then I look at him. With the look that is speaking, obviously, that hello, that's mine. What the hell? Mm. And then he's like, yo, I could use some black. I could do with some black. I Can will. you please give me? And then when I look at him, he looks like someone 
who did not sleep at all because he even has this white stuff around the mouth. The yes. saliva is thick and it's turning white. Yes. So I'm that person who's easily, like, I mean, I would say, I mean, essential vomiter, you see? Mm. So I don't like sharing, especially with yeah. this. So I'm like, okay, fine, you can have it. And then there's James on the balcony looking at me talk that you can have it. And then he starts calling me like, Oi, you need to come back with his arm. Yes. Mm -hmm. See here. Take our towels, we wrap around. We walk back to the house. Okay? We get to the house, we change. Mm -hmm. I think about 15 minutes later, there's a knock at the door. I've already changed into tights and a t-shirt. But um, I didn't see anyone following me with Kerry. And our unit, you wouldn't tell where it is if you didn't follow the road going to it. Yes, yes. You can only see through the balconies because it's blocks and blocks and blocks. It's a complex, remember? Yes. Mm. So it's got passages to go into the units, you see. Okay, fine. We get inside. 15 minutes later, there's a walk. There's a knock at the door. And then James. Obviously, I'm in the lounge with James, but I didn't think the knock would be someone I've just seen. Yes. And then this person shows up. James opens the door. And then when I look, it's this guy. And then he's carrying a happy bubbly. And that's vodka I found with him by the swimming pool. Yes. But he's alone, not with the two girls that he was with that left him in the pool when we were still there. Yes. He's alone. And then James opens the door. And then this guy starts saying like, I don't know whether I'm at the wrong door. And then he looks at me. He's like, oh, no, I'm not in the wrong door. May I please come in? I just want to come chill here. And then James says no. He closes the door and locks the door. He knocks about three times and then he disappears. We eat. Later, it was already dark, past seven to eight. Yes. I'm upstairs with Carrie. And then there's a knock at the door. James won't open. James won't open. Oh, okay. I missed the part before he came back later yes. in the evening. After he knocked, that first time he knocked and James closed the door on him. Yes. He knocked to say, can I come in? I don't know whether I'm in the wrong door or not. And then he sees me. He's like, no, it's the right one. Can I come in? He's got a bubbly. Happy bubbly. There's pipe thing they smoke. Mm. Yes, yes. And then a vodka, that bottle of vodka I found him with. Mm. After he did not manage to get in, he knocked and knocked and knocked. And then James called the gate, the guards, of which during the day there's one guard. His name was Daniel. He came. And then when Daniel got there, he met the guy at the parking lot coming down from our stairs. Yes. Mm. Yes. And then he came up to our unit number. And then he's asking Mr. James what's going on. And then Mr. James is explaining, there's this guy who's very drunk here who won't stop knocking at the door. Mm. This guy just forcefully wants to get inside. Okay, Daniel goes to take, talk to the guy to say, no, don't do that again. Here, we don't go to people's units knocking. Yes. We don't care whether you wanted to chill or what. If the person does not invite you to the unit, you, don't you are do not that. welcome. Yes, you are not welcome. Yes. Okay, he then disappears like that, goes, uh, the day goes by. Around past seven to eight, there's an aggressive knock at the door, but I'm upstairs, I can hear it. We decide to go down and open myself because James can hear the knock. Instead, he's just chilling on the lounge and not opening. And um, I go and open the door. It's this guy. I close the door. He put his foot right in front of the door so that I cannot close the door. He forcefully wants to come in now. He's changed what he was wearing earlier. He's wearing shorts a blue vest, and a, a, a black um, baseball jacket. He's got shades. And then he says to me, I brought your shades. And then I see that, okay, these shades, I was wearing them, but I had forgotten about them that time when I got to the swimming pool because I took them off yes. and put them on the side, which means I forgot them. I left them there. And then he took them. And then later he says, I brought your shades. Okay. I attempt to take the shades. He does not want to give them to me. Mm -hmm. He pulls back the hand. Then James comes to the door yes. to ask him, WTF, what do you want here? What are you looking for? And then this guy, just um, he just burst out with anger and um, accused James of calling him the K-word earlier, of which there was no fight earlier. There was no argument. There was nothing. But he just accused James of being racist and calling him the K-word, and there was never any of that. Mm. So what happens is this guy drags James out of the door outside. Remember, our door is right in front of the stairs going down. Yes. 
He pulls James with a t-shirt. I try pull James back because I see where they're going. They're going to roll down the stairs and it's very dangerous. It's concrete stairs. And then they start fighting. Physical fight. Mm. It's physical. I can see this guy's rage. And I'm like, this is a very young man with power. And James is old. He can never stand this man with the physical fighting. You yes. see? I then intervene in that fight, in that violence. We help each other beat up this guy. But yes, says the power in that guy, I'm telling you, James wouldn't have done it alone because even me. So I join into that fight. We fight him together and I could feel that guy's fist on me that if he hits you with a fist, it's not only going to be your flesh that's going to feel it, even your bone feels it. Mm. Yes. Yes, he's, he's that powerful when it comes to that physical force. Yes. Okay. Fine. We get inside the door. The doctor is there watching the whole thing as well. We get inside the door. I quickly lock the door. I lock and then this guy kicks the door. He kicks the door. He's threatening James hmm. of how he's going to stab him. He's going to shoot him and that he's going to hurt him through me. He's going to prove it to him that he's going to get him. He's going to hurt him through me. And we had to call the guards. And the guard that was on duty was lucky for the evening because the one during the day had already knocked off. But he left a report. Mm. And then Lucky go adds to that report. When Lucky gets upstairs, the guy is still there. Upstairs, on the door. He won't leave our door. And then Lucky takes out the phone to call for backup. He takes Lucky's phone, Lucky was a security guard. Mm. He smashes it on the ground. And then he even uses his, his um, heel to make sure that it's broken. Okay, the backup got there. They tried to defuse the situation, mm. but he was angry at them as well. One of the big guys from the backup ended up slapping him to keep quiet and stop fighting everybody and manhandling the security guards in the yes. complex. They called the police. The police came. Two police guards came from Sentin police station yes. to come and take that guy, that guy away. They told us that, okay, you guys, you're either going to come open an assault case or for restraining order. Yes. Okay. And before we get there, when he when he says to James, he's going to hurt James through you. No, he didn't. He didn't specify what he meant, but he said those words. Mm -hmm. he did, did you understand what he intended? N no, he d I'm only understanding now after this big case he's yes. facing now is. But before I didn't. I thought maybe this is someone is drunk, this someone is on drugs. And then the guards are telling the two cops who came with the police van that they must take him away. Because um, days, days ago, there's a lady in his block that does not sleep. He tried going into her apartment, trying to break himself into the apartment. Luckily, the lady was around or was awake. And the lady called the guards that there's someone trying to break in here. Later, he went to that lady. I don't know. I wouldn't dwell does, on that one too much. But that, before for oh, the okay. Unit 81 okay. in his block. But I did not witness it. The guards witnessed it. Yes. Yes. So the guards were telling us about that incident, that he needs to go to jail. And then the police take him. And um, it was on a Sunday. Yes. They took him. They kept him on Sunday night. They kept, they kept him on Monday night. They released him on Tuesday morning. And on Monday, we already we were going to court on Monday morning to ask for this restraining order because James said that he wasn't going to have time with his work and yes. my, and mm -hmm. my school. We weren't going to have time to be going to court for assault and this. Mm -hmm. Let's just get a restraining order against him. Yes. Okay, we went to court. It was granted to us on the same day, on the 22nd. He came and he was late. He came, okay, we were first called and he wasn't available. He wasn't available that time. And then we were moved back into the line. They dealt with the ones that were present. Yes. Mm -hmm. But eventually he showed up with a friend of his. You could tell that he was so tired. He was so hung over the way he was shaking and having an energy drink constantly. Okay, we were called inside the court. We were told that we're going to um, have to come back on another date. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fine. We went back on another date. When we went back, they wanted to postpone again. The guy ended up saying to the magistrate, okay, as it is the end of the year, he is not going to make it to the next year because this December he's moving to Mpumalang. And in court, that was not going to be followed. That, okay, if he's moving to Mpumalang, we don't see why you guys are continuing with this. And mm. we saw it valid. 
that, okay, fine, he's moving to Mpumalanga, mm -hmm. he's certain about that, and he's told it to the court that he's moving to Mpumalanga. We did not see any reason why we should pursue it because yeah. he was no more going to be close to us or in this province we are in. And we believe no one would just go to the court of law and just tell lies like that. After all of this happens, Bafana then lies and says he's going back to Mpumalanga. The couple doesn't pursue the case further because they believe at least they're happy he's moved out of the complex and they're fine again and they're going on with their lives. Little did they know that Bafana had only just gone home for the December holidays. Otherwise, in January of 2023, he would be back in Johannesburg registering for his second year at Varsity College in Santon. Now, the only thing was that he had moved, obviously, from that place and he had found another place of residence. This time he moved into a more student-friendly residence uh, with many other people within his age range. They would never see him again until, obviously, they saw his videos on TikTok. The year progresses as normal. He's still going out with his friends a lot, drinking. At this point, he had gotten himself a girlfriend whom he would be going out a lot with, like to parties and stuff. So the date now is the 28th of October 2023. It's a few days before Halloween and a lot of people around the city are hosting Halloween parties over this weekend. Now a few kilometers away from Sansin where he lived, there was a pyjama party being hosted in Alex Township and he decided that he wanted to go there and he took his girlfriend with him. He would later state in court that he had no idea who hosted the party, let alone who the people who were there were, besides himself and his girlfriend. But besides that, he stayed there the whole night and parted up a storm and only started making his way back home around 6 or 7 a.m. in the morning. On Sunday, the 29th of October, 2023, at this point, he doesn't mention really where his girlfriend was. But what we know for sure is that when he was going home in the morning, around 6 or 7, he was by himself. He then says that he took a minibus taxi from Alex to Santon and he fell asleep immediately when he got into the taxi, which isn't too shocking considering he had been up the whole night. And unfortunately for him, by the time he woke up, he had missed his stop and naturally the taxi driver wasn't trying to go back for him. So he gets off the taxi and then tries to navigate himself back home. Now I'm thinking he didn't have any cash on him because he was going to be walking back home. And this is when he saw the Santon Sports Club. Santon Sports Club is a prime location at the George Lou Park in Parkmore. It boasts of premier sporting facilities as well as event facilities and has a lively restaurant and bars. And on Sundays, such as this specific one, there's an event that is hosted called the My Run event. So my run is a free walking or running event where you walk or you run for 2.5 kilometers up to 5 kilometers every Sunday. Normally it's up to 20 people so it's not too many people that are at this event and it's running from quarter past 7 in the morning all the way up to 9 a.m every single Sunday. And one of the participants at this specific event was a young lady named Kirsten Clakes. Kirsten Clakes was born in the year 1989 and was only 34 years at the time. She was a teacher who had taught at Vulega SSB High School, Hope High School, and much recently Delta High School. She was an amazing teacher, extremely loved by her students and overall lover of life. Kirsten immensed herself in many things. If she wasn't in the classroom teaching her students, she was outdoors, probably cycling with her father or taking walks. She enjoyed the great outdoors, attended many cycling events in her time, also enjoyed journaling a lot. She was part of a journaling group called Relate Journal Swap Club of South Africa. That was not all that she did. She was also part of Spec Bomb Challenge, which is a group of Spec Bomb conversation enthusiasts. She was doing a lot, okay? She was a lover of life and she was doing a lot and she immersed herself in the things that she loved. Now, on the 29th of October, 2023, Lex was 14 weeks pregnant with her first child. She had conserved via in vitro fertilization. Now, if you don't know what IVF is, it's a process whereby the egg is fertilized outside of the body in a lab and then is put back into your uterus. So if it attaches, then the pregnancy is successful. It's quite a costly procedure. It's ranging from 73,000 rands up in South Africa per round. So if that round doesn't work, then you need to try again and you need to pay again. 
So luckily for Kirsten, it's just 14 weeks prior to this day, she had then found out that she was pregnant. There are many reasons why people go for IVF, either for medical reasons, if perhaps you can't conceive by yourself, or if you want a specific gender, or if you want multiples, or if you can do it for many reasons. So unfortunately, we don't know why she chose this route, but what we know for sure is that Clearly, she wanted a baby. She was excited for a baby. She was ready for a baby to go through this process. And I'm sure she was very happy. On the 29th of October, 2023, Kirsten woke up and prepared for her My Run event. She entered the sports ground through the guarded gates at Halt Street. She parked the car at the top parking area and walked past the restaurant, which is to the right of the tennis court, making her way to the starting point of the race. Once you arrive at the starting point, all participants have to register and wear a tag. Now they activate the tag at the beginning of the race. Now this tag traces how much time you took to actually go through the whole course. Kirsten collected her tag at around half past seven and was one of only eight participants of the race that morning. Generally, it's not a lot of people that participate. It's normally up to 20 people. But on that particular morning, it was only eight of them. The whole race is about five kilometers, which is around four loops around the course. As much as the trail is inside Santon Sports Club, George Lou Park, it takes the participants through a secluded section of the sports complex, completely secluded from the view of the fields as well as the restaurant. Runners actually have to exit the secluded section through a gate that is only open on Sundays between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. when the My Run event is on. Kirsten started her race at around 7.30 a.m. and did her first loop successfully. It is believed at around 7.35, this is when Bafana Mawungela would have gotten off the taxi, he still would not have arrived at the Santon Sports Club. Kirsten did her second loop successfully once more. Now at the beginning of a loop, pictures are normally taken of the participants and at 8.05 a.m. a picture of Kirsten Clakes is taken. She's about to start her third loop around the course. Unbeknown to her, just one minute behind her, captured on CCTV footage, wearing a black t-shirt and a black tracksuit pants with a hat is Bafana Mawungela. He's approximately 100 meters behind Kirsten. Now, it's around this time that he too takes a picture of the entrance gate for some reason. Now, the time is 0806. One minute ago, Kirsten Clakes was taking a picture of 0806. He is captured. And CCTV footage. Now, it's very important to note that it is believed that Bafana definitely saw Kirsten Clakes before she passed away because he is seen on CCTV footage looking towards her direction, also taking a picture, and they were in the same vicinity. Now, this is 10 minutes before Kirsten passes away. From this point onwards, I'm going to start by sharing Bafana's version of events of what happened on that particular day. Bafana claims that as he was walking, through the sports club, possibly to get a shortcut. He walked into the park and as he was walking on the trail, he then saw a rug lying at the far bottom in an embankment. Uh, and he was like, mm, that's a rug. This is what he thought in his head. This rug is far, guys. I'm going to put a video of just where the trail is. So this is the trail. And then this, there, down there at the bottom is where the rug quote unquote, the rug would be to understand this in context. So this is a person that has been out the whole night. He's been out partying the whole night, just slept on a taxi because he was just that tired, has been walking and is trying to get himself home. He's probably annoyed at himself for sleeping in the taxi. And his main mission is to just try and get himself home as soon as possible so that he can rest, right? But not this guy. This guy then says, while he's walking in the trail, trying to navigate himself home, he sees a rug. He sees a rug, guys, a rug, carpet, mat, that type of situation. He sees a rug. This rug is at the bottom of the embankment. I'm going to show you guys again. And I'm going to show you the trail again. And then he decides, I'm going to that rug. Now, the question anyone would probably ask, what... what if I see a rug, I see a rug. Because he's not saying I saw a rug and then I was like, this is suspicious. No, he just saw a rug. He's going to the rug. So he's like, he saw a rug and then he decided, 
He's going to leave the trail. He's going to go down. There's stones, there's rocks, there's trees, there's long grass. He's going to go down there and he's going to go to the rug. Now, the first thing he does when he gets to the rug is he starts kicking the rug. And that's when he says he notices that it's a person. And then this is when then he felt like, okay, I need to feel for a pulse. I need to check what's going on. This person sleeping. And then he, he says he... He starts shaking the body as if you're trying to wake someone up uh, who's been sleeping. I'm going to put a clip of him actually just describing how he did that. So, like there was no response. How were you shaking him? Like I was, hey, hey, like trying how to... Holding him? No, like, you know, like, like, like someone's laying like in bed and you're waking them up, like shaking them. Yeah. But then there's no response. There's no response? Yeah. Yeah. So then I then went and then I turned and that's why I pulled her and then she laid the other way. Yes. That's when I checked for pulse and then I put like my ear on the heart and stuff. That's when I realized that like there's nothing. Like yeah. there's there's nothing, there's no one there. So, so like, that's when I realized that the person is dead. And on top of that, it's a white person and it's a lady. So I didn't want to be involved because I know the gender-based violence in the country and stuff. Yeah. Like I can't After shaking, he feels for a pulse and then he notices that no man, this lady is no more. And then in his mind, he says that the first thing that came to him was that he's black and she's white and people are probably going to blame him for this. His story is that he felt like gender-based violence, femicide, it's a white lady, I'm a black man, and this is what's going to happen, which is I call BS, but okay, let's move on. He then says, he starts thinking to himself, oh my God, because I touched for her pulse, I touched her when I was trying to turn her over. Oh my God, my DNA is all over her and my fingerprints. No, I must undress her quickly so that I make sure that I'm not blamed for this. So this is when he started undressing her. He took off her cap, guys. He took off her t-shirt. He took off her pants, her tights. He took off her shoes. He took, and then he would later state in court that um, she wasn't wearing any undergarments, meaning no top undergarment, no bottom undergarment. I think that's probably not true. He probably took them with him uh, because they were not found with the other pieces of clothing that were found later on. My question to you is, do you not feel any shame? Now you're taking the lady's clothes, her, her tights, her top, her shoes, her cap. You are leaving her as she was the day she was born. Are you, are, what's the thought process? What's the thought process around that? Because, okay, say you didn't do it, but like now you're violating her. You're still violating. You know, you know, there's no difference between you and this imaginary person that you say did this. As if that is not humiliating enough, as if that is not demeaning enough, as if you've not done enough or to, as if you're not done enough to this poor woman. But finally then decide that, okay, he's going to take off his own t-shirts and then he's going to swap it and wear Kirsten's t-shirt. Tell me why. Tell me why you're wearing Kirsten's t-shirt. He, ta he takes off his own t-shirt. And then he uses his t-shirt, the black one. Because it's bigger, I suppose. I think that's his pro thought process here. It's bigger. So he can cover the shoes. He can cover the, the tights. He can cover the cap with his own t-shirt so that people don't just see him carrying around her clothes not covered up so now you would think you would think an old person would think okay you've done a lot now like surely you're going to leave and says no he doesn't leave his next stop he goes to the restaurant which is like within the same park with kirsten's top on with her clothes while he's still carrying her clothes around, he goes to the restaurant and now he later explains in court that the reason he went there is that he was going to ask for the menu and the price list so that he can take his girlfriend there at a later stage. What? Is that your thought process? Is this what you're thinking about? Like say, say, say by some miracle you're innocent and you've just now encountered um, a person who's passed away lying there. Your, your thought process is about taking your girlfriend to a restaurant at the same park where you saw a body. So, so that's after this, after leaving the restaurant, only then does he then leave the premises. He leaves via jumping. So he's not exiting via the gate like everybody else. No, he wants to jump. So he jumps over a fence, not before throwing the clothes over the, first, the fence first and then jumping over next, picking up the clothes and then walking a couple of streets. He's then seen by CCTV footage throwing Kirsten's clothes inside a drain.
Now, as much as the state agrees with his version of events, at the far end, where he's throwing the stuff in the drain, they definitely don't believe the beginning of the whole story. Because now, if you look back, and this is the state's version of events, with just a 100 meter distance between Kirsten and Bafana Mawungela at the beginning of the race at around 8.05 and 8.06, there's only eight minutes between that time and when Kirsten passes away. It becomes very difficult to believe that someone else other than Bafana would have had the opportunity to attack Kirsten, pull her to the bottom of the embankment off the trail so that the other runners don't see her, take her life and still give the opportunity to Bafana to discover the so-called rag and have the whole interaction where he strips her off. All of this happening within a 10 to 15 minute period because I really want to break down the timeline for you guys properly. 8.05, Kirsten's picture is taken by the events organizers by the, when, she's, when she's starting her third loop. 8.06, Bafana is also seen on CCTV footage around the same place, not too far from Kirsten. And then quarter past eight, just about 10 minutes later, Kirsten's phone and keys are found. Now, this basically means that she has already been attacked and she has thrown her phone or her phone fell during the attack. And this is how the other runners found it on the trail. 15 minutes past eight, she was taking a picture of at 8.06. So nine minutes is all the time there is for everything to happen, or at least for Kirsten to pass away from the time the picture was taken of her. Nine minutes. And who was 100 meters behind her? So let's play devil's advocate for a second. Say there was a third person who was coming from the bushes and was going to grab Kirsten, pull her down into the embankment before Bafana gets there. Wouldn't he then, instead of running into a rug, say, maybe run into an attack? I think that's my thinking because he was very close behind her. So instead of now, minutes later, you run into a rug or you see a rug, at the bottom of the embankment, maybe then you were going to see the actual attack, wouldn't you? Also, just to make matters worse, when questioned about the timeline, Bafana's timeline was completely off. Mind you, CCTV footage doesn't lie. Timestamps don't lie. So he was saying that, no, by the time he got there, it was 9 a.m. No, it wasn't. You got there around 7. You left at 10 to 9. Okay, so you were there for a long time. So he was like, no, he only got there at nine. Then that's completely off. At nine, you were gone. At nine, he had already thrown her stuff in the drain. So, so after he had thrown her stuff in the drain, he then went home. Back at St. Sports Club, they already started looking for her. Everyone was in a panic. They searched from quarter past eight. And then finally, around 9 a.m., they were able to find her. Unfortunately, she had already passed away. She was completely naked, like I already mentioned. So she is... <sighs> they were able to find her. And later on, her autopsy would reveal that she had passed from blunt force trauma to the head and as well as smothering. Bafana would later state in his bail hearing that... When he got to raise, he told his girlfriend about what he saw. Two days later, he told his caretaker, who also happened to be a divorce lawyer, Norma, about what happened and just also seeked advice in terms of what he can do. He was seeking advice from the lawyer, Norma, and um, the lawyer was like, no, as long as you don't do anything, as long as it had nothing to do with you or you know that you didn't do anything to the purpose and you have nothing to worry about, which is, I think is just terrible legal advice. Like, especially someone is seeking advice from you from a level of i'm asking a lawyer how about you tell them yeah you didn't do anything but i think just go and report at the police station because eventually they're going to find out that you took the clothes you know but not norma norma's like that's no, fine as long as you know it's not you it's okay he then also went on to tell um his dad what happened told his dad listen dad i was walking through a sports club and i ran into a person that had passed i took their clothes and i wore them and still, the father as well didn't say, hmm, son, maybe let's go to the police station. Maybe let's just report this. A month went by, Bafana continued living his best life. 
And unbeknown to him, the police were working on the case and actually were getting closer and closer to him. Then they started tracing him as he was going through the streets of Santon. Some homes had cameras and they were able to capture him when he was throwing the clothes in the drain. So they, so they got clearer um, uh, images and they used those images to now to try and figure out who is this man and where does he stay? And after a month, they were able to locate him at his residence. They got there and after showing him the picture and asking, is this you? He confirmed it's him and that is when he was cuffed and arrested and he was charged with taking the life of Kirsten Clegg's. After what felt like a very long bail hearing, he was finally denied bail uh, just before Christmas. So he spent his December and January uh, behind bars. He's still behind bars at the moment, at the time that I'm doing this video. Look at what is happening. <laughs> His trial is only due to begin in May of 2024. So we'll definitely be following that and keeping you guys updated. Please, I'm very interested. When it comes to this case, I'm very interested to know your opinions. So please let me know down below. Because you know what? I was doing research on this case. I came across a lot of people who felt like, oh my God, Mafana was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Oh no. You can see how confident he is in court. You can see how he speaks. He definitely is just, he's confident in what he's saying, so he's definitely not guilty. I came across a lot of those, and I'm like, how about we look at everything in context? How about we don't look at things in isolation? I'm not trying to say he did it, but I'm definitely not trying to say he did not. So, I don't know, let me know how you feel about this case in the comments below. Guys, if I catch... If I catch one of you guys saying, where have you been? You haven't been around for a long time. But you guys don't like the videos. You guys are not liking the videos. I don't even know if you like the content that I do. Liking the video does not mean you like what I'm saying in the story or like what happened in the story. Definitely not. It just means that you like me telling the stories. And actually encourages me, guys. But you guys are like, oh no, where, has, where are you? Come back. But do you like the videos though? jokes aside thank you guys so much for watching i'll see you guys in the next video but please like comment share and subscribe bye